Lovely. Thank you. Good evening. Please take your seats. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And I'd like to thank uh, Enid and Lester Moore, Morse for making all this possible. Thank you. And also for the University Club for letting people in, particularly people who don't usually wear ties. Um, just before we start, I want to tell you a few things about what we're doing at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Um, there's uh, a lot of exciting things that are happening in parallel with our renovation and expansion program. In fact, on Saturday, May 12th, we're opening the Cooper Hewitt Design Center at 111 Central Park North, which is just on the bottom edge of Harlem, and that's where we're going to be having our educational programs in the years of our renovation, which is really exciting. Our next show is the graphic design now in production, which is a collaboration with the Walker Art Center, um, co-curated with them. And we're opening that um, on Governor's Island. So for the summer season, you can go any weekend and enjoy the island and the show. Um, uh, it opens on 26th of uh, May, so it's open for the Memorial Day weekend, but we have a reception on the, uh, um, on the 31st, and it goes on through until September 4th. We also have a series of what we call Bill's Design Talks, where I interview people who are great designers, and that's down at the WNYC Green Space this season. We've had five of them, and there's a couple more to come. On the 24th of May, Scott Wilson will be interviewed. He's a, an industrial designer who's done really amazing products which are very entrepreneurial. For example, he's taken an iPod um, and turned it into a watch. And that's been extremely successful. Um, and on the 14th of June, Walter Hood is coming in from San Francisco um, to talk about landscape architecture. And we shouldn't miss the possibility of taking you to Paris because on the 10th of September, um, the House Proud um, exhibition will be opening there. Um, this is the 19th century, um, the collection of watercolor interiors by, um, owned by Eugene Thor. And so that'll be opening in Paris on the uh, 10th of September. So please think of Paris as another option to connect with us. And now I'd like to ask Cara McCarty to come up and tell you a little bit about this series and introduce our speaker. On behalf of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, I want to extend our sincerest thanks to Denny and Lester Morse for your leadership and guidance and generosity in allowing Cooper Hewitt to continue with its rich programming and scholarship during this, these years while the museum is undergoing renovation. We can't thank you enough. The Design Revolution series was initiated by Denny and Lester Morse to highlight the Cooper Hewitt's collection and to give the public access to its unique holdings. Tonight's talk is the second in a series that takes a chronological look at design and the decorative arts from the Renaissance to the contemporary. Our next lecture is scheduled for December 4th, entitled Modern Times, Designing for a New Century. The talk will be given by Cheryl Buckley, Professor of Design History, Northumbria University, Newcastle. That means we've had three Brits in a row giving this series. Um, I wonder what that says. I've been waiting for over a year for tonight's talk uh, since we started planning uh, this series. Um, tonight's talk by Dr. Carolyn Sargentson. I love the title. It's full of intrigue and reminds me of something I would see on Masterpiece Theater. False bottoms and secret compartments locking away the secrets of Ancien Regime Paris. Carolyn Sargentson's doctoral dissertation on lux luxury markets in 18th century Paris 
was published jointly by the Victoria and Albert Museum and the J. Paul Getty Museum in 1996. She worked for 17 years at the V&A, first as a curator, leading the widely acclaimed project to redisplay the museum's galleries of European art and design, 1600 to 1800, and then as head of research. In this role, she managed a series of international collaborative research projects and oversaw the joint MA courses in the history of design. She also set up a program for PhD research in support of which the museum collaborated with various academic partners. She has contributed to numerous committees concerned with strategic research and peer review for, among other bodies, the British Arts and Humanities Research Council, the Getty Grant Program, and the UK's Higher Education Research Council. Three years ago, Caroline left the V&A to pursue her own work, retaining an honorary position as a senior research fellow. She is currently working on the museum's four-volume catalog of French furniture of the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries. She is no, no stranger to New York, having most recently been a visiting lecturer to the Cooper Hewitt Parsons Master's Program in the History of Decorative Arts and Design, where I know her courses were extremely popular. Carolyn's lecture this evening forms part of a larger investigation into concepts of safety, security, and surveillance in elite Parisian household. households. Her forthcoming book is provisionally entitled The Material Culture of Secrecy in Paris, 1627 to 1792. Please join me in welcoming Carolyn. Thank you, Cara. Thank you very much for coming. And I would like to add my thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Morse this evening, because for me, it's a terrific chance to be pulled out of the archives and the museum stores with my screwdriver where I take things apart and to be able to rehearse my ideas and the things that I've been thinking about over the years as I'm formulating this book. So thank you for the chance to present my ideas to you all this evening. I would like to open this evening's lecture by telling you a fairy story. For many of you, this will be a reminder rather than a first telling, since the tale is a famous one. You will not be surprised to hear that it concerns, in part, the story of a lock and of a key. And I use it here to introduce the themes of the lecture, which include, like all good stories, life and death, love and politics, betrayal and murder. So sit comfortably, please. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> Our fairy tale was written by a Frenchman, Claude Perrault. He wrote, Charles, Charles Perrault, excuse me. He wrote including familiar tales to you all, I'm sure, Cinderella, Little Red Riding Hood, Puss in Boots, and Bluebeard, La Barbe Bleue. Um, Bluebeard appears at the top of the early 19th century image that you can see on the right, so it's just up there on your screens. Tales of 1812, because she'll be making an appearance later on in the lecture, and I'd like you to remember her. The fairy tale is a representation of violence, gender arguments and sexuality in which a tyrant almost gets away with the murder of his disobedient wife. It is also, and this is why I'm interested in it, a late 17th century treatise on concealment, on temptation, and on the revelation of a deadly secret protected by an enchanted key. I'm showing you some 1915 illustrations because I can't resist them. They're my youth, but these are not 18th century images, I should point out. Now, you may recall that Bluebeard's wives were numerous, young, and rather short-lived. Following the death of the last one, Bluebeard is about to marry again. All appears to be going well, until he went away, as he frequently did, to war. Handing his wife a bunch of keys, he instructed her in their use. Keys to the armory and the library, the passepartout, a key that opened almost all of the other doors of the house. 
And you will remember that the smallest key on the key ring she was absolutely forbidden to use. It opened a little room at the end of a long corridor on the ground floor of the palace. Inevitably, the temptation was too much for Bluebeard's young and beautiful wife. She opened the room with that little key and she saw to her horror the bodies of her husband's previous wives hanging on the walls, their corpses gruesomely reflected in the pools of blood on the floor. Dropping the key in horror, it became stained with that blood. Blood that could not be removed however hard she scrubbed at it. The key, you see, was enchanted so that it would tell its true owner of his wife's betrayal. While Bluebeard was away, it was the key that was invested through the enchantment with some of the power or the agency of that man. On his behalf, it ran surveillance on that little room that hid such a macabre truth. The instant that Bluebeard demanded the return of his keys, his wife's secret was out. Now, the rest of the story does not concern us quite as magical properties. But what he really needed was a very particular lock that had been invented in London by the 1660s or so. It's a detector lock with both a locking mechanism and an internal system for counting the number of times that that lock is successfully operated. The best way for you to understand how it works is to show you a movie of it, made when it was installed in the V&A's British Galleries a few years ago. So I'm going to be quiet and let you watch this. Now, the English were famously good at locksmithing, as they were with other metalworking trades like clockmaking at this period. According to one native writer in 1686, around the time that this lock was made, they made locks, and I quote, curiously polished, and the keys so finely wrought that it is reasonable to think they were never exceeded. 
The diarist John Evelyn recorded in 1654, even earlier, that a lock with rare contrivances could be viewed as a masterpiece, and I quote again, esteemed a curiosity even among foreign princes, a view corroborated by the purchase of this lock by Cosimo III of de Medici of an English detector lock very like Wilkes's when Cosimo was in London in 1669. Now, let's move away from the locking technology itself and move also from Britain back to France where we properly should be to address the question of what was at stake here. It is very easy to imagine the members of the late 17th and 18th century Parisian elite buying and commissioning locks for their doors and their furniture to hide away their collections, their jewelry and their money. But I want to look beyond the merely valuable in monetary terms to consider what else might here be at stake the secrets of the heart, secrets of state, and even one's bodily safety and virtue. No one expressed better what was at stake than Louis Sebastien Mercier. In 1781, his Tableau de Paris, his picture of, pain, of Paris, claimed that, and I quote, good locks are the most perfect supplement to the police. He went on to wryly observe that while locks were guarantors of public safety, they could not be said to do the same for public morality and nor for its happiness. His witty tongue posited that, and I quote again, love, ambition and politics hide their secrets under bands of metal. What man would not pale with shock if he were to forget to lock his secretaire with the key that never leaves him? So whether an affair of the heart or one of state security, a man's locking technology was a crucial part of that Parisian interior world. For women, just as much, if not more, was at stake. Here you witness a moment when a love letter is drawn from the bouquet of flowers that we assume has just been delivered to this sitter. Her expression speaks of a... kick off a train of risk, entailing a kind of gamble in which her marriage and, in relation to that, her wealth, her status and her reputation were very much at stake. Designing locks, then, was just, a matter, just as much a matter of keeping a client's household and family at bay as of protecting valuable possessions from thieves and housebreakers. The technical ingenuity of the Parisian locksmiths was really reflected said our friend Mercier, the deviousness of their violators, and both were becoming more resourceful day by day. Now, violation is an interesting term here because it reminds us that it is not just possessions such as jewels and love letters that are at stake. For women particularly, one's physical safety and sexual integrity was also up for grabs, as we see in this representation of a man closing the bolt on a door. This speaks so powerfully to my mind of the issue of access to technology, of any kind really. He who had such access was a master of his world. Like Bluebeard, men who were in control of locks and keys were in command of so much more than a piece of hardware. But you'll be glad to hear that among elite, elite society at least, locks and keys were also owned by women. Indeed, there was a version of the Wilkes lock, that detector lock that you saw in the movie, made expressly for women, on which the male figure protected the lock on behalf of his mistress, to whom the inscription on the lock was directly addressed. By the 18th century and in Paris, increasing numbers of women acquired writing desks and jewellery caskets, affording them increasing levels of personal control over their possessions and their secrets. They kept the keys in their pockets. Pockets were not in integral to clothing at this period, rather they were conceived, in my mind, like drawers in a piece of furniture, made and handed, handled separately, but fitting seamlessly into a larger configuration. A pair of pockets like these was worn tied around the waist, close to the body, between undergarments and dresses, accessed through openings in the woman's outer garments. In the concealment of letters in a casket and the key in a pocket, we begin to see the way that 18th century men and women managed secrets and something of their attitudes to risk. In order to protect things of symbolic and monetary value and to function as guarantors of public safety, the locksmiths faced the challenge of devising ever complex mechanisms that would keep their owners just ahead of the game. 
The technical ingenuity of the locksmiths merely reflected, said Mercier, the deviousness of their violators. And both, as I said before, were increasingly inventive in their responses to this challenge. Now, if I'm reading Mercier as he wanted to be read, then Parisian Ancien Regime society had an exceptional capacity for secrecy and therefore unprecedented needs for security technology. There can be no doubt that highly valuable possessions were kept under lock and key on a daily basis, and ever were it thus, jewels are an obvious example. But perhaps even more important in Paris at this period was what I might term the culture of secrecy, in which affairs of love, ambition and politics were just as significant to the operation of fashionable culture as jewels and even money. Now here I want to divert very briefly to signal a wider discourse about public security in France. We have in this man, the Chevalier Deon, a perfect example. He eventually fell from political favour in Paris and lived abroad in England much of the time, in exile. Only later returning to France in the, under the reign of Louis XVI, on the condition, I'm sorry, um, on the condition that he dressed and lived as a woman. This he seems to have done in some considerable style, and actually Louis XVI paid for some of his frocks. Here you see a portrait that was long assumed to be of an identifi unidentified female sitter. It was covered in the usual... Um, discoloured varnish of an old painting, but a recent cleaning, um, a, a restoration, exposed the secret that the sitter was in fact male, and it is the chevalier in drag, if you like, at present causing some excitement on the London art, art market where it has just surfaced, so I'm very pleased to be able to show you it because this is news, I think. Dayon's story beautifully merges the affairs of politics with those of sexual identity, about which there was limitless speculation in 18th century France when it came to his own. He was not alone in combining the political life of a spy for his king with activities that we might locate more in the cultural sphere. Beaumarchais, who he knew, was famously both a spy and the author of the Figaro trilogy, in which secrets, marital fidelity, and a box with a false bottom are a central feature of the last, rather less known play in that trilogy. And it was Beaumarchais who helped negotiate our Chevalier's return to Paris under the reign of Louis XVI. My final diversion is that of Louis XIV's great enterprise of the Chief du Roi, the Grand Cipher of the King, in which a, name, a man named Rossignol and his team of researchers, including his son, created a unique code for the Sun King's secret affairs of state. Based at the Chateau de Juvisy, just south of Paris, here shown on the occasion of one of Louis XV's frequent visits, Rossignol's team developed complex sequences of ciphers and codes, mingling the two together to create a near impenetrable system for espionage and record keeping. And in fact, when the last of that family of Rossignol's died, the secret died with him, and it was a long time before the documents in the French National Archives could in fact be deciphered. This late 17th century code making and code breaking, it seems to me, is very much analogous to the locksmithing and lock picking of Mercier's descriptions of Paris almost a century later. Now, before this evening advances much further, I feel I must introduce the ingenious French locksmiths and explain something of their world, because as you'll imagine, it was rather different to the worlds that we've just been looking at. Like other Parisian trades, they were organized in a guild under the patronage of this saint, saint Eloi. Mercier described the work of this guild as an art de luxe, a luxury art, please note an art, not a trade. He considered them more aligned with the liberal arts than of mere artisanal status. Their guild, like all the others in Paris at the time, commissioned various paraphernalia, including this rare silk banner, which belonged, in fact, to the Montauban Guild. I don't think the Parisian Guild's banners um, have survived. I certainly haven't found one. The guards of the guild paraded in their ceremonial regalia on saints' days and on other processions in the city, holding up a cross such as this one, which is dated 1776. 
those same guards reinforced the guild regulations which were gathered into a series of statutes first recorded in the, 12th, in the 13th century by Etienne Boileau, who published them in 1268. And here he is, a reproduction of him on the um, Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, the statutes of the guild regulated its members closely. And that was no different from the other Parisian guilds, it has to be said. So, no working at night. No working out of sight in a back room. Utterly, utterly forbidden was the making of a key without also having in the workshop the lock for that key. Anyone commissioning a new key from a master locksmith had to produce the lock in which it was to fit, and he had to prove, or she had to prove, his or her ownership of that lock. This was a core principle of the statutes right the way through the history of the guild. The illicit making of a key to another person's lock represented the total betrayal of public security and was punishable by the worst possible means. An example illustrates the severity of the case. An unfortunate locksmith named Bournier was found in 1748 to have contravened the regulations of his guild by supplying to one Baudinet a series of old keys that he had completely reworked without having access to the locks in which they were to fit. While Baudinet, who had commissioned and directed this work and therefore in our world might have been considered morally responsible for the outcome, um, who had supplied Bournier with models and with drawings and written instructions, he was simply branded with a hot iron on his shoulder with the mark of his perfidy. Bournier, however, was taken to a square and publicly hung. Said the printed document that recorded the outcome of his trial by his guild, and I have to read this to you in French because I can't resist it, he was to be pendu et étranglé, hung and strangled, jusqu'à ce que mort naturelle s'en suive, until a natural death ensued. I mean, not so natural to me, but you take their point. It was a thorough job. Now, central to the mission and to the culture of the Locksmiths Guild was the concept of public safety. And here we see a silver coin issued by the Guild, the Parisian Guild, in 1756, with its motto, Securitas Publica, over a pair of crossed keys. From the 13th century right through the 18th century, the statutes repeatedly describe the immense responsibility of that guild and of its incorporated members to protect the public at all times. Indeed, a treatise on locksmithing, published in 1627, had at its very heart the paradox of how to reveal the practice of the locksmith's art, as the treatise was of course meant to do, whilst maintaining proper security for the French public, who relied so heavily on the members of the guild for its sense of personal and public safety. At this treatise on the art of the serrurier, the locksmith, written by Mathieu Rangius, was entitled La Fidèle Ouverture. It purported in its title and in the frontispiece which you see on the screens, a trusty opening, a fidèle ouverture of the secrets of the trade. In the text, however, Juste defended his protection of secret knowledge, even from his guild members, on the basis that he could, and I quote, neither teach nor show a secret that would jeopardize public safety. Now, the master locksmiths worked with hot metal in the forge, and as such, they were one of the trades working under the influence of the god Vulcan. Here's shown at the lower right, or the right-hand side, um, of this um, late 17th century tapestry working at his furnace. And here, in an engraving of very similar date, the serrurier is represented with a forge at his very center in place of his heart. This engraving, part of a fascinating series on the trades of Paris, and any students in the audience, and I know some of mine are here, this is a good PhD project for you, shows the artisan with his hammer and tools, surrounded and at one with the metalwork that he produced. Locks and keys, hinges, handles, latches, door knockers, and a range of decorative architectural ironwork. The serrurier's technologies, his knowledge, and his products with the forge at the center form his very being. He embodies these things. It's a fabulous engraving. There's one for almost every trade in Paris. To become a master locksmith, a maître serrurier, a masterwork had to be produced. Here we see a 17th century lock with its key designed to be fitted to a coffer, a chest. 
It is made with three bolts, which you can see, uh, sorry, wrong button, up at the top here, the three bolts will be shooting up. And you see here that it's elaborately decorated in the cold with engraved ornamentation on the inside and the outside. Another example of a masterwork in the form of a door lock, I'm sorry, um, this time dated to the 1730s, a little later, is even more complex. The housing assembles with open work panels to either side, here and here, here and here, each cut with a cipher A in the, century, which, uh, in the center, which I hope you can see on the slides, and with a fleur de lis, perhaps in hopeful anticipation of future royal commissions. The fleur de lis pops down here and here to reveal the lock. The key is an extraordinary construct in itself, as you can see, the bit elaborately cut to make the whole system highly secure. Now is the moment to point out an anomaly in translation to avoid too much confusion. The term locksmith, our English term, does not exactly translate the French term serrurier, at least in Ancien Regime language. The locksmiths were in fact a specialist subdivision within the guild of serrurier. As we saw in de Lamassin's print, the one with the furnace at the heart, that guild made decorative ironwork, such as these gates dated 1202, made for the choir of a church, and staircases and balconies, such as this very rare and extraordinarily beautiful 18th century model of a balcony, which is only about two feet wide, it's in miniature, um, beautifully forged with the cipher LC, presumably for the potential client to which this model was presented to secure the commission. The Serrurier also made street furniture, such as this elegant shop sign, à la Levrette, at the sign of the Greyhound, possibly the name of the locksmith who owned the shop um, was Levrette. Um, sometimes you would have such a play in the name of the shop. The whole suspended from this bracket to project elegantly into the street to advertise the identity of the locksmith with the door to the shop at street level. Um, 18th century Paris was full of these signs. They cluttered the street so much that the police around 1760 decided that all signs... and no, no room for a balcony without a door, a window behind it. So each item is designed here as part of a larger system, and in that sense, the locksmith were making highly elaborate technologies that were designed to fit very closely with the work of other trades. Second observation that I'd like to make here is that the serrurier were engaged in making devices that very much articulated the transition between one space and another between the external and the internal, between the public and the private. Here, for example, we see both parts of a lock of a type used for a bedroom, which you can see just out of focus at the front of the slide there. and unlocks the door manually at night from inside the room, while the key is inserted from the other side to lock it on exiting in the morning. This lock is signed by a man called Jean Dutartre, and it's inscribed in French. 
court in Spain. Dutart was probably a Frenchman working for the Spanish court. And the locks in the Cooper Hewitt's collection here, and I want to say now how grateful I am to Cindy Trope and her colleagues for an extremely agreeable day about a year ago spent looking at the collection. In the meantime, if you want to see the Cooper Hewitt's locks, you should look at a catalogue of an exhibition that was held in, I think, 1987, called Safe and Secure. Um, you'll see the, the highlights of the collection published there. Now, locks made for furniture were not so different in design and function to door furniture. They articulated the threshold between different household spaces, and they provided a variety of levels of security within the home or the palace. Here we have an armoire, a cupboard, built in two parts with four doors. The dividing line is here, just here. Um, it's in the V&A's collection, and its locking hardware is really quite exceptional for its date. It's very late 17th century. The gilded hinges, the latches, and the locks are visible only when the piece is open via a rather complicated spring lock with a key that you have to position in a very particular way, counterintuitively, in order to insert it. A secondary lock secures a pair of strong boxes in the lower case, and you can see the one on the right-hand side, I think, on your screen. See Yes, um, is pulled forward to show you how that works. Each hinge plate, and there are 20 in total, um, is of the door. So what I mean by that is that these hinge, pairs of hinge plates that, on which the doors are hanging, let me catch up on this side here, are set utterly flush, each one numbered with its Roman numeral behind um, chopped into the carcass to permanently mark the relationship between that cast hinge plate and that space in the substrate. And the locks and the latches at the top sit proud of the door and not embedded, I want to say, within it. On a commode of 1774, made for the eldest daughter of Louis XV, we see what is in a sense, a, a essence a somewhat discrete exterior in that the locking hardware and the technologies on the inside are not immediately apparent. A single plain escutcheon, the keyhole surround, is set neatly in the marquetry on the upper drawer front. You can see it just here. A bit of mathematics you can see involved in getting that right. And the marquetry distracts attention both from the keyhole and the break between the upper and the lower drawers, which you can see here. Only the four drawer knobs, located either side of the central marquetry reserve, give away the two-drawer structure. Meanwhile, the eye is very much seduced away from the locking system and the contents of the commode, if you like, by the glittering mounts of gilt brass in the form of infant tritons at the four corners of the commode, and a semi-naked Venus who is reclining seductively on the apron mount at the center bottom. In the day book of the royal household in which the delivery of the commode is recorded, it clearly states that the two drawers close with one single turn of the key, d'un seul tour de clé. The lock is fitted directly behind the keyhole that you see on the screen, and the turn of that key simultaneously triggers a bolt to drop into the dust board here, so it's dropping down into this dust board, as another shoots up into the top rail here. And what you're seeing here, here's the top rail here. So one bolt's dropping down and the other one goes up at the same time. And you can see the marbles removed in these images, so you can see the mortises in the lock a little bit more clearly. So what you're looking at here is quite a degree of coordination between the metalwork and the woodwork. The two combine to create a system that works smoothly and reliably. A secure piece of furniture or a box often relied on both a metal worker's and a cabinet maker's mentality. And I'm very grateful for Daniela gross kids look of the Metropolitan Museum for pointing this out to me when we were looking at a piece in her galleries made by a Frenchman where the entire locking system was thought about and conceived and designed with a woodworking mentality, whereas other pieces in the collection were very much put together with a metalworking mindset. When a cabinet maker integrated a lock into his furniture, he often incorporated a device or two of his own. 
as we see in a small reading and writing table of the 1770s, in which, once the table was opened with the key, a shallow oak drawer can be accessed from the right side, concealed under the false bottom of the freeze drawer. And I'm sure you're with me here, but it's this little door here. When I first went to unlock this piece as, as, as in, in my very early days in the museum, there was a bomb alert. One of the bombs had gone off at Harrods only a few weeks earlier, and I'd just got that drawer out, and it was very, very sticky, and I had to make the decision of whether to stay in the museum and put it back together again and risk being blown up, or leave it in pieces and risk coming up and find someone had run off with the drawer. So I stayed. <laughs> I have a long history with these pieces. Now, these false bottoms were called faux fonds or double fonds, false bottoms or double bottoms. And they were not particularly uncommon in the furniture of the Parisian elite. In fact, I would argue that people became, as the 18th century progressed, rather more competent at discerning them. When a man named Custine, guessing that his wife's love letters were kept in a box with such a false bottom, investigated the case, he received a rather huge shock. And I quote from the story. I knew by its depth that it had to have a false bottom. As a result of looking for the secret, I touched the spring that revealed to me the bottom, which is very deep, and which contained an infinite number of notes and letters from my brother, all expressing in the most passionate language a love that was clearly well advanced and used all imaginable means of seduction. Thus, the unfortunate Monsieur Custine discovered the correspondence between his mother and his wife through his own intuitive ability to understand the possibilities of the spatial arrangements and mechanisms used in boxes for the protection of secrets. His account suggests a developing capacity to read and to talk about furniture. But his success recalls Mercier's warning that the locksmiths were not able to contribute to the sum of human happiness as effectively as they were able to guarantee public safety. But, as in the case of Bluebeard's young wife, the temptation was quite irresistible. In characterising the challenge to the Parisian locksmiths as a technological race against the ingeniousness of the city's thieves, Mercier suggests a constant search for improvements to the security of a lock. There are a number of ways of achieving this. One tried and tested method was to increase the complexity of the ward to a lock and of the bit to the corresponding key. By the ward of the lock, I mean the internal obstructions that are built in at the point where the key is inserted. And here, I'm showing you a key. These are the bits of the four keys that you see on the screen, um, all of which come from Jussi's Fidel Ouverture of 1627, the treatise that I showed you um, the frontispiece of a little bit earlier. Elsewhere in his 1627 treatise, Jus explains that a coffer could be closed with up to 15 different bolts, recommending the use of as many bolts as possible to secure, the simultane secure simultaneously all sides of the lid to the box. Now, Jus, living in the 1620s in France, took life rather literally, which I think was his very much his milieu culturally and in terms of his knowledge and the state of the art of locksmithing. He was not one for tricks, the kind of tricks that we're rather seduced by um, in the 18th century. And his proposals for increasing public security lay very much in technological improvements to the hardware itself. By the later 17th and the 18th centuries, though, tricks and decoys were much more common. And here I come to a lock that I'm very fond of in the Cooper Hewitt's collection. On the gilded brass lock plate of this piece, we see a number of intertwining strategies, both technological and symbolic, to engage the legitimate user of the lock and to distract the intruder. First, a sphinx acts as a symbolic guardian of the lock. You'll recall that she also guarded, in, in that one representation at least, Bluebeard's castle. This cast and gilt brass sphinx forms the handle that slides the bolt manually, and you can see that it's been slid. So the sphinx has glided along the top of the lock in its groove, and the bolt here has come across. So this sphinx started off somewhere over here, and it's glided over to the right, moving the lock with it. Very basic mechanics, it has to be said. However, perhaps it also posed the, uh, symbolically the riddle of the classical sphinx. In classical mythology, if the sphinx's riddle were wrongly answered, you may recall that the sphinx would launch a vicious attack. 
So here, perhaps the key stood in for the answer to the riddle. Perhaps the key was the answer to the riddle. Only if the proper key were used would the Sphinx allow passage in the room behind. Any of you who've seen Harry Potter movies will remember that from the third or the fourth movie, I can't remember, where the Sphinx is in the labyrinth. Or perhaps the riddle that is connoted by the presence of this Sphinx was to do with finding access to the keyhole, which is concealed behind a piece of brass that is screwed to the front face of the lock housing. So here it is, static, and when you just flip that decorative bit of Rococo foliage to the right, the keyhole is revealed. So it's closed and it's open. Now this kind of trickery is simply not in evidence in Juice's treatise of 1627 with its endless, quite endless, variations on the cutting of the bit. Nor did his designs make much reference to the cultural world around him. He focused on a much more limited range of technological possibilities. But later, and in the 18th century, it seems that locks were often designed to be both technologically complex, but also witty, even conversational, to incorporate a narrative that served a secondary purpose to that of the security. It commented rhetorically on its function. What I'd like to question is whether this was in fact a secondary function at all. It's easy to imagine that the lock and the key, the closing and the locking is the primary function and the symbolism and the decoration is secondary. But I suspect that by the late 18th century, that narrative might have become quite as important as the technology. For example, a lock made some 150 years after the publications of Juice's manual surely speaks of the analogy between gambling and secret keeping in the way that these four bolts, which you can see lined up here, are formed as suits of a card deck. From the top, the club, the heart, the spade, and the diamond. Perhaps the trèfle, the trefoil, the club, of the lock housing signifies a game where the club trumps. And anyone who can tell me what that game is um, gets a brownie point, because I'm curious as to why the club here is actually forming the top of the lock housing. Now, all these technologies were all very well, but there was one obvious problem that remained despite all the extra bolts, the complex bits and wards, and the secret mechanisms. And the problem is the key. What happens when you lose a key? Such losses are played out repeatedly in the fiction and semi-fictional tales of the 18th century, indicating a real preoccupation with secrecy and the exposure of illicit behavior. The moment of revelation was, of course, the high point of the story, and I'd like to share one with you. In a story published in 1716, Don Francisco Benavides, a Catalonian captain of dragoons, a romantic figure, conducted largely by letter a love affair with a Lady Margarita of Perpignan. After a rare summer spent together, I'm going to quote now, the commerce of letters recommenced and continued for five years without her husband's having any suspicion he knew very well that she had an esteem for the captain, but nothing of their correspondence. And she took her measures so carefully. I envisage her with a key to a box, the key in the pocket, etc., etc. And I quote on, but one day going to mass and leaving her keys in her cabinet, an officious servant acquainted her husband that her mistress had left her cabinet open. And her husband tumbled things about until he found a letter which awaked his former jealousy and made his wife feel the effects of it. Ouch. Now, ideally, the loss of a key or its theft by a servant or a spouse would not always result in the exposure of every secret. And I think this is one um, development that's very much an 18th century one. Here's an example. This marquetry box, made between about 1770 and 80, is cleverly designed with two secret compartments and a false bottom and a secret compartment in the lid, all using different technologies. In the left side of the box, which you're seeing now open, a drawer springs forward when a secret lever is activated. The lever is accessed from inside the box. So what you're seeing here is a little wooden lever or key that you lift, and it's just here. So you're looking into the left side of the box. Of course, to access it, you need to pull back the tambour um, in order to see the little key that is there. Once you, here's the box open, and you can see the tambour pulled back on the left side, and you can just see the, the, 
the little wooden key there. Once triggered, the spring forces the lock to jump out of the case. We see in the same image a secret compartment in the lid, and that's released by rotating one of these up here to the right. Um, and the box has a false bottom beneath the tambours, which you can just see here and here when the tambours are pulled back. Now, if you could drift across to the right side of the box and look at the side with the gilt brass handle, you will perhaps agree that it's impossible to detect the presence of the second secret drawer. The decorative marquetry is mute. There is no wooden key behind the tambour. You'll have to take my word for that. So if, like Monsieur Custine, we were searching for secrets, we might assume we were done when we'd opened the left side and we'd dropped the lid. But if we simply slide the panel of marquetry with the handle attached up in the grooves on either side, the second drawer is revealed. A countersunk drawer pull, which you can see here, here, sits flush with the drawer front, just behind that marquetry panel, and the drawer can be pulled out of the box quite easily. Now, given that human management of the key appears to have been the weak point in conventional locking technology, I would like to propose now that the 18th century search for the perfect lock took three strategic directions. In the first, a conversation between the owner and his or her furniture enhanced the mechanical security system. In the second, the function of the key was redistributed to the owner. And in the third, certain functions of the owner were embodied in the mechanics of the lock. And I'm going to show you examples of these. To understand the first strategy in which a conversation between the owner and his or her furniture enhanced the mechanical security system, I had to enter into a rather frustrating relationship with this apparently unassuming table made by Jean-Francois Urban in about 1760. Beautifully decorated with marquetry, which once would have been highly colorful, its exterior offers, offers little clue to its inner mechanics. When opened, the small drawer at the front can be pulled forward. This is the little drawer here. This is the first thing to be drawn forward. And that trips a catch on the way that releases a pair of strong tensile springs, steel, in the back of the case. You can't see those. These drive the large drawer unit, by which I mean all of this, the drawer units housing the small drawer, forwards with some force. There's a huge clunk and it flies forward. That force is then transferred by a system of cogs and teeth, actually in the sides of the case, in the swell, which you can see the swell in the sides here, uh, there, sorry, that's it. Um, so that force is transferred by the cogs and teeth, again concealed, to the mobile tabletop, which moves backwards with a corresponding action. The table has sprung open, and it's ready for use. It is fully accessible at this point. A reading slope, which you can see with velvet um, raised here, comes up on a ratchet system, and a shallow compartment just behind it is revealed. The sound of the teeth of the ratchet system engaging with the metal support at the back of the panel is rather satisfying. So far, so good. The husband has the furniture open and he's free to explore its depth. His problem, however, arises when he tries to close it. Because the only way to lower the reading slope is to activate this inconspicuous steel frame on the underneath of the drawer unit. Do you see the three sides there of the frame? Here, made of steel. It's linked to a series of levers that releases the ratchet when the frame is drawn almost imperceptibly forward, allowing the slope to be lowered and the table to be closed and locked. Now, I had to work this out as a rookie curator on my own, using touch more than intellect. And the experience taught me a valuable lesson about the multisensuality of, of mechanical furniture. I needed to look, feel, and think all at once. Without this sensual conversation with the furniture, the table would speak to its mistress of its violation the moment she entered the room and saw it standing there. So rather than exposing to the husband his wife's secrets, the table was turned, so to speak, to expose his subterfuge instead. 
Here's the second strategy, the combination lock. Oh, I'm sorry. Here we are. Now, replacing a conventional lock and key, which you see here in rather miniature form on this um, portfolio, um, with a combination lock was another very clever strategy. Here's a similar portfolio with six rotating disks set with a secret code. What's quite amusing about it is when it came up on the market, the secret code was set to A-L-O-U-I-S, and it was sold as the portfolio of Louis XVI. But here in the, um, in the um, combination lock, the key is internalized in the human body, or perhaps I should say the mind, and it dies with it. The problem of losing the key is solved, but the problem of remembering the password, as many of you will know if you're anything like me, rears a new head. Now, the third strategy was to embody more agency in the lock, more power in the lock, more capacity for action in the lock, transforming a relatively straightforward mechanism into one that takes action on behalf of its owner. The point here is that, just as on Wilkes's lock, the lock became more than an inert piece of hardware activated by a key. And it became a piece of technology that would take action itself. Let me give you an example and invite you to participate in another bit of storytelling to enliven you just as the lecture approaches its conclusion. Here is a quite extraordinary door lock, perhaps to a port cochere on the streets of Paris. So imagine yourselves to be gentlemen burglars equipped with a key made by Monsieur Bournier, that unfortunate locksmith who was pendu and étranglé. Only yesterday this happened, unbeknownst to you, and I'm afraid you'll have to grant me artistic license here because I have to remind you he, was, he died in 1748 and this lock was made much, light, much later. Bournier, to whom you have paid a considerable sum, has guaranteed that his lock, his key, is ingenious and that it will open this door and grant you access to the treasures within. You approach the door, quietly confident that your false key is the best on the market. The lion is fierce, and his jaws are open. There are other door knockers and lock plates just like this in Paris. In fact, you saw a rather similar design just a little earlier in the day when you were casing the neighborhood. You approach casually with a key in your hand. You insert it, you turn it, and without warning, the lock springs into action and the jaws clamp onto your wrist. It is extraordinarily painful. And however much you struggle, you cannot extricate yourself from its grip. A crowd quickly gathers. No one can help. Nothing seems further of their minds. They are, in fact, immensely enjoying the spectacle of your disgrace. You are trapped, mortified, and afraid. Now, these jaws are normally maintained open by a spring mechanism inside, in, in the lock itself, which when a false key that is not exactly and precisely cut in order to fit the ward within, um, it, 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 it releases that spring, closing the jaws with considerable force. These sprung mechanisms, once you release them, slam into, in, in, into position. And as Mercier said, the lock is the perfect supplement to the police, and this, I think, is what he meant. Those jaws would hold you there until the Parisian constabulary came along to cart you off to the local magistrate. Another example employing the same technology gives the same painful outcome. No, I'm sorry. This is the lock after it's been activated by a false key. You see it here before anything happens at the top left on your screen. The keyhole on the top right is surrounded by a pierced decoration. The decoration is deceptive, like the marquetry on Urban's table. It conceals a more complex series of surprises than you might think. To the lower left of your screen, on the turn of the false key, the clamps have sprung up, shaped on their inside edges to follow the form of a rather narrow wrist. On the lower right side of the screen, you can see the lock from another angle. And if you look back at the top left image, you can just see that the sides to the frame that encloses the decoration are formed by the top edges of the clamps. And I mean here, sorry if I'm not doing this very accurately, but you can see here the top edges of the clamps before they jump into position. Now, one of the most elaborate locks I've ever come across, and the last one I'm going to show you tonight, was a very similar lock with what was called a pince-voleur mechanism, a grip-the-thief mechanism. 
Now, if that were not enough of a deterrent, the risk of getting clamped to the lock, this one, had, had, once it had a misguided intruder in its grip, would then pre proceed to shoot him by firing a pistol <laughs> that was embedded within the lock itself. And I have to say, I very nearly titled this uh, lecture The Killer Locks of 18th Century Paris. But... So here's an early 19th century version of that lock. There are two 18th century versions in two French collections that I've not yet seen, but this is a, a slightly later version. Um, and it's... Um, the pistolet is ready to fire in the top of the wooden substrate. And it's shown here alongside an engraving on the right side of your screens, dating from the 1780s, that was part of a publication that explained the technology of the shooting lock, of the killer lock. Such a lock, said Mercier, in a spirit of complete understatement in my view, quite penalizes the hand that touches it. And when a rich man died, he said, the hand of the man that placed and removed the seals on certain secret cupboards, the commissaire de police, trembled in his knowledge of modern locksmithing, anticipating that the spring mechanism of the cupboard might cut off his hand. The richer the deceased, concluded Mercier, the more cautious the commissaire. Now, Mercier spoke in the late 18th century of a rather important phenomenon in my view, the serrure savant, a knowing lock. To be savant in 18th century Paris, in Enlightenment Paris of Mercier's time, was commonly very much a human trait. And it is fascinating to find him describing a lock in this way. I believe that he was, consciously or not, alluding to the kinds of locks that we've just been looking at. Locks that stood guard, that detected security violations, that took actions that announced one way or another that a violation had taken place. These locks and keys were the French versions of Wilkes's locks, ma ma made a century earlier in England, invested by their makers with agency, with near-human behavior. These knowing locks, serrure savante, challenge and complicate our understanding of the relationship between men and women and technology. And I wonder whether they might even represent a discourse about the essential nature of each. Now, Mercier characterized a kind of race between locksmith and thief, as we heard earlier. His serieux savant was surely one of the outcomes of that race, perhaps the first to cross the finishing line. In our digital world, we experience perhaps a similar dialectical race between code writers and code breakers, between those that purport to defend us and those that attempt to break through our protective technologies. We may not risk being shot by a pistolet in a cupboard door these days, but identity theft, illicit surveillance, and domestic and political subterfuge are no strangers to us at all. So I'd like to conclude by proposing that present discourses about safety, security, and surveillance are not entirely disconnected from those of the past. They encompass both affairs of national security and of personal security and privacy, and there are risks, losses, and gains inherent in the technologies that we develop now to give us our sense of security in our modern world. We are perhaps more familiar than at first we think with the men and women of Ancien Regime Paris, and perhaps Mercier et Serieux Savant are the direct antecedents of the intelligent systems on which so much of our private and public lives depend today. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for questions, and there'll be people with mics, so if you want to ask a question, that would be terrific. But if you could just wait for a mic to be brought for you, and then to speak into it, as my colleagues at the QPU had said, like a rock star, that would be very splendid. And then everyone will be able to hear. Does anybody have any comments or questions, or an answer to my question about the, the deck of cards? Question at the back over there. Thanks, Sarah. Mention anything about the chastity belt keys? Yes, the Chatelaine. It's another subject. <laughs> Invite me back. It's a. It's a. There are lots of related subjects. In fact, yes, quite, quite, very good point. And good collections of those too. <laughs> Is there another question? I think. Oh, behind you, May. Do you know when you 
You have two questions on that side, and then there's somebody over here. We'll come to you in a moment. Could you hold fire for a moment for us? Then we'll get you a mic in a minute. We'll need a mic at the front in a moment, please. So thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question was if there was a relationship between the, the Locksmith Guild and I suppose a puzzle or a larger um, labyrinthian uh, guild, if, there, if, if such a thing existed. So are you asking how the Locksmiths Guild related to the larger guild picture? N uh, yes. Uh, my question was actually if there was um, a counterpart to the Locksmith Guild uh, that was more of a, a puzzle-making guild. I wonder that's if there a, was a, a good, relationship. That's an interesting question. Not that I know of. Um, the locksmithing guild, the Serrurie, started as people who worked with the forge, wrought, you know, making wrought iron objects. Um, I, don't I don't know of a puzzle-making guild. I don't know if anyone else has any ideas about a puzzle-making guild um, in the trades. But no, not that I know of, not that I know of. I think the analogies are more with these cultural tendencies to make codes for different reasons and to engage in this kind of trickery, which here is a kind of three-dimensional, hard, inorganic material, but that sort of appears in organic textiles, in the chiffre du roi, in the code-breaking culture, and in this whole area of espionage. I, do, I, do, I think card playing and gambling is the same, but the card, there is a guild of card makers, but they're not really puzzle makers, I think. I think. Thank you for the question. Can we, I know we have somebody who is waiting here. Would you like to ask first, and then perhaps we could come to the front um, with May? You mentioned the development of the collections in the V&A and the Cooper Hewitt. Were there any particular collectors uh, in the 19th century who focused on locks? That's a, it's a very good question. I would say that the, mo the key collector that, that I know of is this man called Le Sec de Tournel, who published his collection, I think, in the very early 20th century, and it lives in this extraordinary building in Rouen that's actually an old church, um, full of decorative ironwork hanging from the walls. It's the most remarkable place. And there are various collection catalogues, and they actually did an exhibition there called La Fidèle Ouverture, taking up Jusse's treatise title um, a few years ago, and their website is fantastic. So I would go to that if you wanted to have a look. The other way of, of, of pursuing this is to go through sale catalogues, where you, there are various dealers in Paris, uh, Fresse, for example, at the Hotel Drouot, who recently, last year, I think, sold a big collection of locks. It's still, it's still quite a, a living collecting area. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, how does one go about finding if there are areas in a piece of furniture <laughs> that, 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 that look like they might have things? Great we question. Can you, uh, in Rockstar we, Mike, Mike, We have please. boxes Thank that you. have the, uh, these, these sliding drawers and things like right. that. But in a, in a large piece of furniture yeah. with all kinds of curves and, and drawers and this and that and the other thing, it gets so complicated. It is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to become Monsieur Custine, who was able to read his wife's box from the outside and calculate intuitively and mathematically where the hidden spaces are. And it is absolutely fascinating because you don't need a lot of space to put a love letter. You need a little more space to put an entire correspondence. You know, the seven-year affair requires a certain amount of space. But it, it's a very good question. And, and the answer is as much intuition as intellect, I think. And I was in, invited to Philadelphia a long time ago and asked to take apart a piece of furniture. And I think we found all the compartments. But the, the paradox is we will never know. We will actually never know. Uh, yes, have... X-raying is a good idea. Sorry, Carolyn, we have another question over here. Please. Uh, in a number of these uh, examples, it seems like uh, the, the technology actually affords women agency they probably otherwise wouldn't have had in, yeah. in, the, you know, in the time. And so, Can you speak up a tiny bit sorry, for us? Thank you, thank you. Have you come across anything that would suggest why the, these uh, locksmiths guilds would be so uh, either in tune to that? Is it strictly capitalism? Is there another... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing you. Is it strictly capitalism or is there another issue sort of at hand? Why would they be so sympathetic and interested in uh, providing mm. a technology for sort of the, the, 
the B team, the, the lower classes? It's a, the that's a very interesting question. I would say that there are probably several forces at play, and the market must be one of those forces. The Commerce de Luxe was, was Paris's great commerce. Um, and so luxury product, products of every kind found a circulation on that marketplace with relative ease. And the marketplace was competitive, so the quality was driven up by the market. So yes, there's a strong argument for capitalism there, I think. But I think the cultural forces were very strong. And one of the things that I think might be worth developing here is the sense that the, the, these concepts of secrecy that you can locate so easily in the Parisian clients, Parisian culture, are not unfamiliar to the locksmiths because they're trading in their own artisanal secrets all the time, like other guilds are. And I think there's quite an interesting match between the locksmiths and their clients that you don't always find in other, if you like, working relationships. Often your, um, your cabinet maker doesn't own the kind of furniture that he makes for the clients, but I have a sense that the locksmiths and their clients had an interesting understanding with each other in a slightly different way. Thank you. Uh, sorry, yes, one more question. Sure. Um, an interesting point. One of the things that was so fascinating about your talk is the development of the technology of lock making. Do you, have you found in your lock sleuthing that um, when a technology has become outdated, they just scrap the entire piece of furniture or do they replace mechanisms? That's a really interesting question. It's, it's often the case that locks get replaced. So I'm going to answer your question by slightly circuitous means that might not quite address what you want me to because I don't think I quite know the answer. On a lot of the, the furniture that I know best is at the V&A because I've taken it all to pieces. And there are quite a lot of locks that are clearly replacements because when you take the lock plates off, you can see the chopping away underneath of the substrate of the door. And if you x-ray things, you can see that things used to be bolted in here into a mortise, but now they bolt in there. But I'm not sure whether it's because the lock failed to work or because a new lock was put on because most of the locks are fairly traditional. They're mortise locks. They flip a bolt into, in, into the, the post, if you like. But it's an interesting... Uh, another slightly scutious way of answering your question is to point back towards the 16th century and the 17th century um, because the Wilkes lock was actually portable. Cosimo III of Medici's lock, which you also saw, was portable. You took it and you could fix it on a door wherever you travelled. So that is a kind of slightly different take on your question, which I can't directly answer. And we have in the v &A the Beddington lock, which was Henry VIII's lock that he took everywhere with him, and his servants bolted it to his bedroom door wherever he was. Well, this is the irony, the absolute irony of all of this is if you want to get at what's inside, you just smash it open. It's all symbolic in the end, isn't it? All this great effort, you know. Yes, more questions. Hi. Um, Hi, I so. really enjoyed your lecture, and I was just wondering if you could speak to how the culture of secrets and secret keeping might have changed after the French Revolution, if at all. It's a good question, and I can't really answer it because I've never looked at that period, because I run out of steam fast after Louis XVI gets his head chopped off, not least because he was a secret keeper, which was a terrible, terrible betrayal um, of his role as king. He was also a locksmith, um, as we were saying earlier when we talked over drinks. Now... Um, the 19th century is quite interesting. And again, I'm going to be rather circuitous in my answer because what happens in the 19th century in South Kensington is that the V&A, the South Kensington Museum, puts its furniture on display and in Paris, they start to copy it. And this is the subject of an entirely different lecture, so I won't give you anything but the short version. When they copy our French furniture, they do not re reproduce the secret drawers. So my sense is that some kind of one might call it democratization, but I, ex I expect the academics would pull me up on that. But the kind of shift from an elite court culture, as Paris had and really Britain didn't so much in the 18th century, I would say, that there's such a change of gear in France that by the 19th century, on the whole, this is, this is not a secret-keeping society. And of course, it's also a post-enlightenment, post-revolutionary society that must set itself, itself up with different values to the Ancien Regime, which was a secret-keeping culture, by, um, absolutely by definition. And I think politically and culturally, um, 
it wasn't the world of this kind of technology. Having said that, there are lock breakers who come to Chubbs in London and, you know, they pick locks in the window in the 1840s, I think, or maybe later. There's a, there is a whole territory there. And technology doesn't stop, but I don't think it follows exactly the same trajectory, if you like, as, as that 18th century French one. How are we doing? I think Hi. you just partially answered what I was going to ask. I was wondering, since you were focusing on France and the period you were, whether Louis XIV's creation of Versailles, mm. where all of a sudden the elite and the, the politically and the aristocracy were all under one roof, yes. had a noticeable impact on the creation of more secret keeping and lock keeping and so forth, or is it just part of the fabric yes. of the whole culture. No, I, th I think there probably is a sea change under Louis XIV, and this housing of people densely in the palace is one of those things. But I'm not sure that Versailles drove it, I have to say. I suspect that it's driven more in the city of Paris. Would you like me to jump off the podium, Bill? <laughs> so my, sen my sense is, pro and this is quite true of quite a lot of decorative arts developments in 18th century France, actually. It is not driven entirely from Versailles, although it's more likely to be with Louis XIV. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. I call that wonderful scholarship, amazing intellectual rigor, wonderful humor, great storytelling. Did you notice that she was also very good with the modern equivalent of the pistolet? And she was always pointing the things in the right spot on the screen. Thank you so much, Karen.